Now I noticed on Gold Money, when looking at some of the founders and uh, board of directors and so on of Gold Money, it looks like reading a who's who of precious metals and from James Turk, the uh, co-founder, his son, also Eric Sprott from Sprott Asset Management. And one of the things I noticed was a statement on there about helping customers to experience gold as money. And I wonder if you could start there by talking to us about why it's important for people to break out of our current modern paradigm and instead just to understand gold or precious metals as money. Yes, certainly. Well, anything can act as money. It's a matter of choice. I mean, you, you and I can um, deal between us and accept whatever you and I agree is money. Now, normally what governments do is they like you to accept their money and they insist that you pay taxes in their money. So uh, within a country's borders nowadays, the most common money in circulation is actually produced by government. But the problem we have with government money is that they can increase the quantity of it at will. And this means that uh, it is a feature of government currency, fiat currency, if you like, that um, uh, they tend to collapse. In fact, none have lasted uh, very, very long. When I say very long in the context of history, I mean, you can get a currency lasting 100 years or so, or maybe 200 years or 300 years, but they all eventually die. Uh, the first currencies were actually invented by the Chinese uh, a long time ago. I think about uh, 800 AD, 900 AD, something like that. And uh, the great um, uh, Genghis Khan or Kublai Khan, his son, uh, int introduced uh, currency and what he what he wanted was everybody had to submit all their precious stones and their gold and silver in return for which he gave paper currency which was made out of mulberry leaves. So you can see that uh, from Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan's point of view he gets an awful lot of real stuff for which he just does his paper receipts. So that's really what government currency is, it's paper receipts and it can be expanded as well at will. The other thing, of course, is that banks create credit. Now, they create credit out of thin air. And this is a process which is not normally understood by people. But, but basically, if you walk into a bank and say you want to borrow a million dollars and the bank agrees to lend you a million dollars, the bank doesn't hand over its money to you. No, it just opens an account and credits that account with a million dollars out of nothing. And as you draw down that million dollars, it's obviously got to replace it in the form of deposits from somewhere else. Now, if it hasn't, if it can't attract a deposit to match it or deposits to match it, then it merely goes into the money markets and borrows the money to cover it that way. So at the end of the day, the bank balances books. But the fact is that it has created a million dollars out of thin air. Now, if you or I were to do that, we would be in jail pretty quickly. The only reason banks can do it is because the government licenses them to do it. So you can see that there are two ways in which government money can be expanded. The one is the central bank prints it. And the other way is that the banks uh, create credit um, by um, uh, lending money to, to ordinary people. So um, this inherently is an unstable situation. And over time, of course, the quantity of money in circulation tends to grow and grow and grow. And if you add into that um, modern macroeconomics, um, which basically reckons that um, the cost of money should be kept as low as possible to stimulate the economy, what then happens is that um, low interest rates uh, lead to the creation of even greater quantities of credit. So it, it is inherently an unstable situation. Gold, on the other hand, um, is money that grows only at the pace at which it is mined. And in very approximate terms, that's something like one and a half to two percent per annum. And it's been like that um, more or less throughout history, I suppose. Well, not quite. But um, the, the, the thing that's interesting about it is that that rate of growth more or less matches the rate of uh, growth of the global population. So um, the, 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 the purchasing power of gold is inherently stable, and that's very nice. But from a government point of view, um, you know, this is no good because uh, gold is something that you have to acquire. You can't create it out of thin air. So you can see that there is immediately there's a sort of them and us situation developing between government who want to create money out of thin air and license the banks to do it. Uh, and uh, ordinary people who don't want their currency debased. 
Now, it doesn't matter too much if you and I get into that transaction and I buy something from you and I give you some money, so long as you get rid of that money very quickly, because um, you don't want to have it depreciating. If, on the other hand, you sell something to me and you decide you want to save the, the, the money that I've given you, then you're going to be a lot more interested in having a money which is stable and is not going to lose its purchasing power over time. And so I think what I've done is I've sort of set the scene as to what the essential difference is between precious metals, particularly gold, to, to uh, um, a lesser degree silver, and paper currency. That, that is the fundamental difference. Now, we have at the moment an accelerating pace of money creation so that the devaluation of paper currency is likely, I say likely because many factors affect prices, is likely to accelerate over the next five to ten years. Now, if that, if that actually happens, then the purchasing power of gold remains stable. Gold will emerge as the better money, and you will find that you'll tend to spend gold or save gold and get rid of the paper. Uh, and uh, the price of gold will go up relative to paper. Now, this is already happening in Asia. This is why the Asians are so keen on uh, on um, on gold and silver. I can remember when I first went to India, which was in about 1965, the price of an ounce of gold rendered into jewelry was roughly 160 rupees an ounce. Today, it is closer to 80,000 rupees an ounce. So that you can see that uh, for the average Indian, um, having a bank account and leaving his money on deposit in rupees, he has lost relative to actually putting his savings into gold. Now, the Indians know this, and this is why they do like gold so much. As far as they're concerned, it is the family pension pot. Um, they acquire gold when it comes to um, special events. Uh, you've got Diwali, which is an annual festival, which we've just had. You have marriages, you have uh, betrothals, you have children and so on and so forth. And these are all occasions when gold is bought in the form of jewellery. And the turning gold into jewellery in India is a, you know, it's a 10 percent cost or something like that. It's very low cost. Um, and uh, turning that into jewellery, it is acquired and accumulated by the family so that they've got this nest egg. And that is terribly important. And that is it's very cohesive for Indian society. And it's not just India. If you were uh, um, in, in Turkey, uh, you would have found that the lira suddenly lost six noughts. A million lira became one lira back in 2004. And why was that? The reason for that was that they had year after year of 100 percent inflation. Um, I remember first dealing in Turkish stocks back in the early 1980s, and it was quite amazing, really. The inflation at that time was 89 percent. It continued um, at that sort of pace for quite a long period of time. The current government changed things a little bit. But you can see how this impoverishes people. I mean, if you had a million lira and suddenly it turns into one, I mean, you know, that's the degree of impoverishment you've had from just pure savings if you would held those in Turkish lira. And not surprisingly, uh, gold is very much a feature of commerce in uh, in Turkey. So that's, um, you know, that's, if you like, the whole raison d'etre. And that's now leading to geopolitical um, uh, uh, um, in, involvement, if you like, in gold, because the Chinese and the Indians and the Russians and the Iranians and the Turks and all the rest of it, the whole of Asia are quietly acquiring physical gold. At the same time, we sophisticated guys in the West are quietly disposing of it. Um, why? Because we think um, like uh, sort of we've learned to think how stock markets work, you see. So what happens is you will buy into something which is on a rising trend and you sell into something that's on a falling trend. You don't value anything anymore. You just look at the trend. And if the trend in gold is down, then basically you sell your gold. And that's basically what's been happening. Nobody's been thinking in in uh, uh, the advanced economies at all. We have got used to doing without gold. We have forgotten its 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 fundamental role. Um, but meanwhile, uh, the demand for Asia has more than absorbed all the mine supply. It has absorbed all the loose stock 
um, if I call it loose bullion, if you like, bullion, um, which is sort of shaken out by, from discontented um, owners in the West. And the result is that there is very little bullion around at the moment. So, um, you know, one way and another, if you look at the investment prospects for gold uh, on a value basis is probably pretty good. But that's not really why I recommend people buy gold. I recommend people buy gold and silver, for that matter, um, on the basis that if we get a real systemic crisis, then that could well lead to a catastrophe for currencies. Maybe not all currencies, could be all currencies. I mean, this could be an event which we've never seen before. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm saying there's a risk it's going to happen. What you then need in that event is real money to spend. And that's the whole reason, really, why people should have some gold and have some silver.